الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد فقال جل وعلا ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام لا تقوم الساعة حتى يبعث دجالون كذابون قريب من ثلاثين كلهم يزعم أنه رسول الله أخرجه الإمام البخاري في كتاب المناقب Respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Not very long ago, I received a phone call from Brother Ahmed asking me to give a talk on Qadianism. I agree. That's why I'm here today. Having said that, he didn't tell me what aspect he wants me to talk on. And nor did I ask. And we left it at that till a few days ago when I started reading up on Qadianism. I found that one can tackle this title from three different angles. We can either look at the verses and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding the finality of prophethood. A hadith which proved that our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the last of all prophets and there is no prophet after him. Secondly, we can either look at the history, history of Qadianism. How it began, the enemy behind it, its aims and objectives. Or finally, we can look at Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani the founder of Qadianism and the false prophet of Qadian. These were the three different options open to me. And I chose the latter. Because to look at the history of Qadianism would take a few hours and demands a lot of concentration on your behalf. On a Sunday afternoon when the sun is shining, surely that would be asking for too much. Then we have the verses and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu regarding the finality of prophethood. They are so much in number and so clear that they need no explanation whatsoever. The hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an akhrajahu al-imam al-Bukhari can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari. Ana khatum al I am the last of the prophets. The hadith of Sayyidina Jabi radiallahu ta'ala an can be found here again in Sahih al-Bukhari. فَخُطِمَ بِهِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Exactly the same meaning. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam said, كَانَتْ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلِ تَسُوسُهُمَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ كُلَّمَا هَلَكَ نَبِي خَلَفَهُ نَبِي وَإِنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِ That the people of Banu Israel were guided by prophets. Every time a prophet passed away, another succeeded him. Another one came. There is no prophet to come after me. وأنا الآقب والآقب الذي ليس بعده نبي يرجعن ذا حديث بخاري that I am the last in the sense there is no prophet after me نبي عليه الصلاة والسلام said to سيدنا علي أنت مني بمنزلة هارون من موسى إلا أنه لا نبي بعدي يرجعن ذا حديث سهيل بخاري نبي عليه الصلاة والسلام said to سيدنا علي that you are related to me as سيدنا هارون was related to سيدنا موسى عليه السلام except there is no prophet after me the hadith in Sahih Muslim. فضلت على الأنبياء بستة. That Allah has bestowed upon me six favors which Allah has not bestowed upon every any prophet before me. And one of these favors, 
Khutima bi an nabiyyun that I'm in the last in the line of the prophets. Yet again the hadith in Sahih Muslim, one of the most authentic books of Ahadith, Fa inni akhirul anbiya wa masjidi akhirul masajid. That I am the last of the prophets and my masjid is the last of the masaj. So these hadiths are so clear that they don't need me or any other scholar to explain them to you. Anybody who speaks a bit of Arabic can work out the meaning for themselves. That finally left me with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, the founder of Qadianism and the false prophet of Qadian. And I have brought with me a lot of references and a lot of quotations. And the reason I have done this is so that you yourselves can listen to his words. And by listening to his words, you yourselves can judge him. Whether he was a prophet or whether I believe, as I believe, the clown of Qadiyan. Every prophet that has come has performed a miracle. By Allah's leave in support of his claim that he truly is a messenger. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani also believes the same. When Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. was thro- when Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. broke the idols, his people decided to punish him. What does the Quran say? فَحَرِّقُوهُ وَانْصَرُوا آلِهَتَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ فَاعِلِينَ They gathered wood. A huge bonfire was made. When it became hot, they threw Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. inside the fire. The Quran says, يَا نَارْ كُونِي بَرْضٌ وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ that Allah addressed the fire and said, O fire, become cold and peaceful upon Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. Now the speciality of fire is that it burns. What is fire? It is a thing that burns. In spite of this speciality, Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. came out of the fire without a single mark on his body. This was a miracle of Sayyidina Ibrahim a.s. As for Sayyidina Isa a.s. or Prophet Jesus, as known to some that don't understand Sayyidina Isa, the Quran says, أَنِّي أَخْلُكُ لَكُمْ مِنَ الطِّينِ كَيْهَةِ الطَّيْرِ فَأَنْفُخُ فِيهِ فَيَكُونُ طَيْرًا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ He would take clay, he would make a figure of a bird, and he would blow inside it, and this bird of clay with the permission of Allah would become alive, and it would fly in the air. وَأُبْرِيُ الْأَكْمَهَا وَالْأَبْرَصَ The Quran says that he would cure the leper and restore the eyesight of those born blind, something that the doctors of the 20th century cannot do. وَأُحْيِي الْمَوْتَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ He would bring the dead to life, all with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dead man or woman would come out of the grave, speak to those who knew and recognized them, they would die again and they would be buried. وَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا تَأْكُلُونَ وَمَا تَدَّخِرُونَ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ The Quran says that he would inform them of what they had eaten and what they had stored in their houses. Every individual he would tell them that this is what you have just eaten and this is what you have stored for tomorrow. These were miracles of Sayyidina Isa a.s. As for Sayyidina Saleh, when his people demanded to see a sign, a miracle, to prove that he is the messenger of Allah, he asked them what miracle would you like to see? They said, أَخْرِجْ لَنَا مِنْ هَذِي صَخْرَ نَاقَةً مُخْتَرِجَةً جَوْفَ That take out from this mountain a she-camel which is ten months pregnant and then this she-camel after this come out of the mountain should give birth to a young one which is exactly which, say, which exactly has the same size is exactly the same in stature and body. Sayyidina Salih alayhi salam prayed to Allah and before they knew it, from the very same mountain came out a she-camel, ten months pregnant, and then the she-camel in turn gave birth to a young one, which was exactly the same in stature, body and heart. This was the miracle of Sayyidina Salih alayhi salam. Every prophet 
has performed a miracle by Allah's leave in support of his claim that he is the messenger of Allah. Our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was no exception. The Ahlul Seer, the historians write that our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed around 3,000 miracles. The hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, a group of disbelievers came to Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam and said, if you truly are the messenger of Allah, split the moon into two pieces. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam asked, will you believe in my prophethood if I'm able to do this? They agreed that we will believe. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His prayer was answered. He pointed towards the moon and the moon was in one piece no more. Half the moon was on one side of the mountain and the other half was on the other side of the mountain. And then Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam called these disbelievers by name so that they be a witness to this event. And now they saw the splitting of the moon. They saw that half of the moon is on one side of the mountain and the other half is on the other side of the mountain. But in spite of this, they said, this is, ma- this is magic. Now Abu Jahl said that what we will do is ask those who live outside Makkah because if this is magic, then those living outside Makkah will not be affected by this. So every time somebody came from outside Makkah, somebody came from outside Arabia, they asked them whether they saw the splitting of the moon. And they would confirm that, yes, we saw the splitting of the moon into two pieces. Now this miracle of Rasulullah wasallam was not just restricted to Arabia. People saw it from different parts of the globe. If you look inside the book Tariq Farishta, it is written that when the Raja of Maliba heard of this event from the Muslims, he caused an inquiry to be made by the scholars of his religion. To the age, Nabi Ali Salatu was was made a prophet. The Bremens conducted a research, and their research led them to the confirmation of the splitting of the moon and the Raja of Maliba embraced Islam. If you look at Suwani al Haramain, the book Suwani al Haramain, in, in this book it is mentioned that, in, that there was a city in the province of Malwa near the river Chamba. The Raja of this place was sitting on the roof of his palace and he witnessed the splitting of the moon into two pieces. And then he saw the moon go back together again into one piece. He asked the pundits regarding this incident and the pundits informed him that in their religious books it is written that a man will be born in Arabia and this miracle will take place on his hands. He sent a messenger to Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam and he embraced Islam. And Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam named this Raja as Abdullah and his grave exists to this very day outside the city of Dahar and people visit his grave. So this miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seen by all the people in the world from different parts of the globe. Another miracle, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim narrated by Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and he says that Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam said that the hour will not come Till a great fire will which come out of Hijaz and it will shed light on the necks of the camels traveling from Syria, from in the land of Syria to Busra. This is what Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam predicted. Six hundred years after Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam died, in the latter part of the Abbasi rule, on the fourth of Jamad al Akhir. After Isha on a Jumu'ah of great fire came out of Madinah to Al-Manawwar. This fire was like a huge city in which its tower and fort were appearing. The historians write that it was 12 miles long, 4 miles wide and around one and a half man statues high. It flowed like a flood and it thundered like lightning. The right that had a strange characteristic that it would burn stone. The mountains dissolved and flowed like powder. But strangely, it had no effect on trees. And the people of Medina would work during the night just like they would work during the day. And the light of this fire could be seen from as far as Makkah al Makarramah, which is over 400 kilometers away. So Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam predicted 
And this prediction came true after 600 years. Nabi Ali Salatu was salam left this world. So every prophet that has come has performed a miracle. Now, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani also knew this. That every prophet that has come has performed a miracle. Now, to justify his claim to prophethood, <coughs> he also claimed to have performed miracles. Surpassing Nabi Ali Salatu was salam, he claimed to have performed 10,000 miracles. You can see this in his work, Brahin Ahmadiyya, volume 5, page 56. Let us look at some of his miracles or some of his predictions. Before we do so, listen to what he's written. He writes, <coughs> you can find this, Marginal Note Arba'een, number 4, page 30, by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. He writes, If out of my hundred predictions, one turn out wrong, then I will admit that I am a liar. Ruhani Khazain, volume 19, page, two, two, page 288. To judge my truthfulness or lies, there is no better test than my prophecies. Aine Kamalati Islam, page 288. Let it be known to unbelieving persons that my truthfulness or falsehood will be judged by my prophecies. There is no other touchstone for it. Basically straightforward. That if one of my predictions goes wrong, then I am a liar. That I am not a prophet of Allah, I am lying. Never mind one prediction, today we will, have, we will look at two predictions. There was a Christian priest called Abdullah Atam. Now Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani debated and argued with this Christian Padri for 15 days on different aspects. 15 days they argued, argued and debated but this so-called prophet of Qadiyan was unable to defeat this Padri. Now he's unable to defeat this Padri after 15 days he predicts and prophesizes that within 15 months of this day, this Christian Padri will fall into Hawiyah. Hawiyah is hell. Or he will return to the truth. Meaning that he will renounce Christianity and embrace Islam. That one or two things will definitely happen. Either he will die and his abode will be hell. Or either he will renounce Christianity and embrace Islam. Now when he made this prediction, Abdullah Atan was 70 years old. He was 70 years old. And it is more than likely that somebody will die within, at that age. For him to have died within the 15 months was more than likely. He was already 70 years of age. People die at this age. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended to expose his falsehood. This is what he wrote in this respect. He wrote this on the 5th of June 1893. So if we work out 15 months from the 5th of June 1893, we've got July, August, September. Three months. The following September, another 12 months. That is 15 months. So the 5th of September 1894, Abdullah Atam should have died or either he should have renounced Christianity and embraced Islam. This is what he wrote. You can find this in Jange Muqaddas, page 189. I admit right this time, that if this prediction goes false, that is, if within 15 months from this date, the party who is on falsehood in view of Allah, does not fall into Hawiyah as death punishment, then I am prepared to undergo every type of punishment. Disgrace me, blacken my face, color a rope around my neck or hang me on the gallows. I am ready for all. I swear by the greatness of Allah's glory that he will certainly do the same 
will certainly do the same. Will certainly do the same. Earth and sky might, may deviate, but not his ordainment. If I am a liar, keep the gallows ready for me, and consider me the most accursed of all the accursed persons, evildoers, and satans. I repeat, if I am a liar, keep the gallows ready for me, and consider me the most accursed of all the accursed persons, evildoers, and satans. This was his prediction. Time passed. Days passed. Fifteen months passed. There is only a night left. What happens? The whole of Qadian come out of their houses. The young, the old, the weak, the male, the female, and the praying to Allah, Ya Allah, our time may die. Ya Allah, our time may die. They're rubbing their noses on the ground and praying to Allah, our time may die. And they're certain that Abdullah will not live to the next day and see the light of the next day because their prophet had prophesied that he is to die within 15 months and there is only a day left and he's definitely going to die next day. This is what the people of Qadian are doing. And the prophet of Qadian, what's he doing? He's casting spells, magic, for his death. He had charms recited over black grams and had them thrown into dry wells so that this Abdullah Atham dies by the next day. Next day comes and Abdullah Atam is still living. No does he renounce Christianity, no does he embrace Islam and he's alive. Not only is he alive, he lives for another two years after this. He should have died by 5th of September 1894. He died Another two years after this, July 1896. And this has been confirmed by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani himself in the book Anjami Atam. So he said, if one of my predictions goes wrong, then I am a liar. He further said, if I am a liar, keep the gallows ready for me and consider me the most accursed of all the accursed persons, evildoers and satans. So this is why I consider him the most accursed of all cursed persons, acting upon his own teachings. And this is why we consider him a, a liar, that he was not a prophet. Because he himself said that if I am a liar, then I am not a prophet. And this is why we believe he was not a prophet. This was one prophecy that went wrong. Let us look at another prophecy that went wrong. He claimed that his marriage, proposed marriage with a woman called Muhammad Begum, was a sign of his prophethood. Now, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani had a relative living in Punjab. He was called Mirza Ahmad Beg. And his daughter was called Muhammad Begum. He liked this woman. He was overtaken by her and he wished to marry her. He asked for a hand in marriage. And every time he asked for a hand in marriage, Mirza Ahmad Beg would refuse. Now what does he do? He wants to impress Mirza Ahmad Beg and to scare him. How does he go about doing this? He says that he received a revelation from Allah and he saw in this revelation his marriage with this woman Muhammad Begum. And Allah had assured him that he's definitely going to get married with this woman. Firstly. Secondly, if any of the relatives object, then the relatives and this woman Muhammad Begum will be caught up into in various different kinds of calamities will fall upon them. This is what he writes. He wrote this on July 10, 1888. He writes, That absolute omnipotent has told me, start negotiations for the elder daughter of that person. The elder daughter was Muhammad Begum, and that person was Mirza Ahmad Bey. In case of declination from Nikah, the end of that girl will be extremely bad 
And if she will be married to another person, he, within two and a half years from, and similarly father of that daughter within three years will die. Then in those days, attention was applied again and again for further clarification and details. It came to be known that God Almighty determined that he will bring the elder daughter of that person into nikah of this humble self after removal of each hindrance. Be clear to the evil-minded that in order to judge our truthfulness or falsehood, there can be no greater touchstone of test than our predictions. You can find this in Majmu'i Ishtiharat, volume 1, page 157-159. Now he propagated this so forcefully through his letters, through his books, through his leaflets, that if this person, Mirza Ahmad Beg, was a faint-hearted person, he would have given his daughter in marriage. And if we look at all the works of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, we find that this drama went on for a few years. He begged him, he tried to persuade him, he tormented him, he threatened him. But at the end of the day, Mirza Ahmad Beg was the cousin of Mirza Ghulam Muhammad Qadiani. He didn't budge an inch. Never mind budge an inch. He gave his daughter to one called Sultan Muhammad. Look at his revelational foretelling, what he said. He said in this extract, If she will be married to another person, he within two and a half years, blah, 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 will die. Basically means that if the husband is going to die within two and a half years of the marriage, means that the woman will be widowed after two and a half years of her marriage. The woman will be widowed two and a half years after she gets married. Unfortunately for Mirza, she wasn't widowed two and a half years after her marriage. She lived for 57 years after this. Husband and wife happily married. 41 years after Mirza's death. And 16 years in Mirza's lifetime. This is the first thing that's gone wrong with this revelational foretelling. The second thing is written here. If she will be married to another person, he within two and a half years from... And similarly, father of that daughter within three years will die. That the husband will die after two and a half years. And the father of this woman will die after three years. Basically means that the son-in-law to be, I mean the son-in-law will die six months before the father. If the husband's going to die two and a half years, and the father three years after the marriage, basically means that this husband's going to die six months before the father. Yet again he failed. Because the husband did not die six months before the father. The husband lived for 57 years after the father. And the father died before the son-in-law. And the third place where he went wrong was he said, he will bring the elder daughter of that person into nikah of this humble self after removal of each hindrance. That Allah will make sure definitely Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani will marry this woman. He never married her. Basically means that Allah didn't help him one bit. So in one prophecy, he's made four mistakes. And according to what he'd said, Earlier, if out of my hundred predictions one turn out wrong, then I will admit that I am a liar. To judge my truthfulness or lies, there is no better test than my prophecies. Let it be known to unbelieving persons that my truthfulness or falsehood will be judged by my prophecies. There is no other touchstone for it. We've seen two prophecies and both went wrong. We don't have time for more, but I assure you, you look at the relevant, relevant books and you will find they're all like this. 
Now it is essential for every prophet of God that he respects the prophets before him. Not only does this himself, but he exhorts others to do the same. It is not fitting for a believer to dishonor any prophet. Never mind one who claims to be a prophet, he goes and um, insults a prophet of Allah. No prophet has ever insulted another prophet. Why? Because every prophet has come from God. Every prophet is a deputy of Allah. He has been sent by Allah with exactly the same message, La ilaha illallah. We will find that the only person that has insulted any prophet is this false prophet of Qadiyah. He's insulted Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Prophet Jesus. Na'udhu billah, like none other. Now having said this, in his early days he believed in Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He believed in Prophet Jesus. And he believed in the dissension and in the return of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He believed this. Not only did he believe this, he supported this with evidences and arguments. Listen to what he's written. The prediction made in the Ahadith about the second coming of Messiah, son of Mary, is a prediction of the first order, which everyone has accepted unanimously. The manner in which the predictions are written in the Siha, no prediction is proven to be equal to it. It enjoys the highest status of Tawatur, the Gospel also endorses it. Izale Awham, volume 2, page 400. He further writes in Izale Awham, page 557, This is not a hidden matter that the prediction for Masih ibn Maryam coming again is a prediction of the first grade that has been acknowledged by everybody unanimously. Out of all the divinations recorded in books of traditions, this one is proved to be matchless. Among the Tawatur category, First place is occupied by it. In Jeel, Gospel also confirms this. Now in his early days, not only did he believe in the coming of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, he also made it clear that he was not Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, and whoever called him Jesus was a liar. Listen to what he writes in this respect. Neither I am the promised Masih, nor Masih ibn Maryam. Therefore he who calls me promised Masih lacks intellect, and one who calls me Masih ibn Maryam is a knave and a first class liar. So looking at his writings, earlier writings, he, cla- he believed in Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He believed that he will descend for a second time. And he made it clear that he was not the promised Masih. And one who called him the promised Masih was a liar. This was his early career. Then something went wrong. He first claimed to be Mathilul Masih, a likeness of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. And he claimed this post for seven years. After claiming this post for seven years, something went wrong again. And he claimed to be the embodiment of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. He claimed to be the living Masih, the promised Masih himself. That's a slight problem here. The problem is, he also claimed to be Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. Anybody, even a child in madrasa, five-year-old child will be able to tell you, whether he's a Muslim, whether he's a Christian, he will be able to tell you that Maryam, Mary, was the mother of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, was the mother of Jesus. How is it possible for a man to be a male and then become a female or become a mother and then the child at the same time? Now he has to justify this. Listen to how he justifies this. And you can find this in Kashti Nu, page 87-89. He writes, He, referring to God Almighty, Name him Mary in the third part of Barahini Ahmadiyya. Barahini Ahmadiyya is his own work. Later, as is evident from Barahini Ahmadiyya, I was reared in the form of Mary for two years. Then my body was filled with the soul of Christ. 
Just as the body of Mary was filled with Christ's soul, and in a metaphorical sense, I became pregnant with the soul of Christ. <laughs> At last, after a period of many months, I was metamorphosed from Mary into Christ by a divine revelation, which has been recorded at the end of part 4 of Barahini Ahmadiyya. Hence, in this way, I became the son of Mary. For those that haven't understood this garbage, basically means he said that I was Mary, for two years I was Mary. The mother of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. Then I became pregnant. And then from my own abdomen, I came out as the son of Mary. Kashtinu, page 87, 89. Now you can understand why I call him the clown. I mean, in, in the 20th century, if they, if they want to, how can we believe this? Slight problem. Because earlier we've just read that he said, The prediction made in the hadith about the second coming of Messiah, son of Mary, is a prediction of the first order, which everyone has accepted unanimously. He said that these hadiths are matchless, they're authentic. Now, what does he do with the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Now that he's claimed to be Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, only one option is to play with the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, for example, the hadith of Nawasim bin Sam'an, which can be found in Sahih Muslim, which states regarding Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, yanzilu indal manaratil bayda sharqiyya Dimash. This hadith of Rasulullah and the other hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam state that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam is going to descend from the heavens. This is the belief of the Muslims. Now, how does he go about playing with this hadith? Because he himself has acknowledged that these hadith are authentic. He writes that where in the hadith it is mentioned dissension, Nuzul, it doesn't mean Nuzul. It means that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will be born in Qadiyan. Okay, now the hadith says Dimashk, not Qadiyan, that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will descend near the white minaret in Damascus. Now, how do we go about changing this word? It says that it doesn't refer to Dimashk as in Dimashk. Dimashk is referring to Qadiyan. Okay, fair enough. What about the Dajjal? The hadith mentions, the very same hadith mentioned, that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will descend and he will kill the Antichrist. What about this? He says it's not referring to the Dajjal, the Dajjal here means the Christians. And he goes on and on and on and on, playing with the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now that he's claimed the post of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, it was necessary that his character and personality be superior than Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, be higher than Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. Now how does he go about doing this? He goes about doing this by insulting Prophet Jesus Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. Let me quote a few passages what is written. You can find this in Zamimai Anjami Atam Qadian 1922 page 6. He writes, Christians have attributed a large number of miracles to him, referring to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Jesus. But the fact is that he could perform no miracle. Ever since the day he abused those who demanded miracles from him and called them scoundrels and, he uses the B word here, the respectable and noble people parted with him, for they do not want to become scoundrels and, by asking him to produce miracles. What does the Quran say? That he would take clay, make a figure of a bird, he would blow, and with the will of Allah it would become alive and flat. And all the other miracles which I related earlier. So this totally goes against the Muslim belief, even the Christian belief. Another extract. He writes, It appears from the Gospel of Matthew that he was hard of understanding and had a coarse brain. He did not consider epilepsy to be a disease, just like the illiterate woman and commoners. Rather, he thought it was the spell of a jinn. Of course, he was in the habit of using filthy and abusive language. Now, from this extract, it is apparent that he is accusing Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam of two things. Hard of understanding and had a coarse brain. Basically, he is accusing Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam of having defects. 
And the second thing is accusing is in the habit of using filthy and abusive language is accusing Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam of having of using filthy and abusive language. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, just like every other prophet, was free from these allegations made against him. Just like every other prophet, his character was sublime. And Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam did not come here to teach people to use filthy and abusive language. He came here to stop people from doing this. As for the clown himself, he was a master in using abusive language and as for his defects, they're uncountable. Let us see what he himself has written, that what the things that he was suffering from. He was suffering from impotence. He writes, Maktubati Ahmadiyya, volume 5, page 14. This decrepit is suffering from weakness of brain. Basically means he has no head on his shoulder. He himself is saying this. For a long time after I got married, I used to think that I'm impotent. So two things, no head on the shoulder. Leave it to that. Tariyakul <laughs> Kulub, page 35-36, by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani himself. He writes, <coughs> By the time of marriage, my heart and brain were very weak. And I was suffering from many diseases. Amongst them, diabetes, millet, headache, dizziness, have been with me for a long time. Because of these, I had bitterness, sadness of the heart, and hence absence of sexual power. You have a few more here. Maktubat Ahmadiyya, volume 5, number 2. Writing to Hakim Nuruddin, Mirza says, That I felt great improvement with your medicines. Few diseases like lethargy and gastric acidity have been cured by it. I had one very serious problem. Not one for the masjid. <laughs> Nuzul al page 2066, footnote by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. Revelation was sent to me regarding marriage. At that time, my heart and brain and body were very weak. Apart from diabetes, dizziness in the head and sadness of heart, I was suffering from tuberculosis, TB. Siratul Mahdi, part 1, page 51. He used to get attacks very frequently and his health was generally down. Siratul Mahdi, part 1, page 51. Hazrat was a chronic melancholic. This illness was inherited. Mirza Saab had a real uncle whose name was Mirza Jami'at Beg. He had one son and one daughter and both were suffering from mental defects. Boy's name was Mirza Sher Ali. Girl was Hurmat Bibi. She got married to Hazrat Saab. She was suffering from mental defects and she got married to Hazrat Saab. He himself doesn't have a head on his shoulder. He himself has said that. Perfect match. You can find the Siratul Mahdi, part 1, page 5, 1. Siratul Mahdi, part 2, page 135. His molar teeth and caries, which used to pain occasionally. The end of one molar became pointed, which caused also on his tongue. It had to be filed away. Siratul Mahdi, part 2, page 198. Once he fell down from a window and injured his left arm, which remained weak till the end. Do you think Allah is going to ever send a prophet suffering from all these things? Impotence, melancholia, hypochondriasis, di diabetes, hysteria, poor memory, excessive urination. He himself has written that sometimes he would go to the toilet for a hundred times a day. There's reference for this. Think about it. hundred times a day, how long does one spend in a toilet? Doing a stanja? Say minimum three minutes. Minimum... Three minutes. Hundred times three is three hundred minutes a day. Divided by hours as five hours a day. <laughs> I mean if he's spending five hours a day in the toilet, when is he conveying the message of God? He was suffering from dizzy spells, insomnia, epilepsy, depression of heart, and so forth and so forth. That in spite of all these illnesses, I mean he himself said that he's got a weakness of the head, weakness of the brain. His followers claim that his, men, his mental development astaghfirullah was better and superior than our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he himself is saying this decrepit is suffering from weakness of brain. He's, he's saying this and his followers are saying the mental development of the Prophet Masih was higher than of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is only a partial superiority which the promised Messiah has over the Holy Prophet. So he 
insulted Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam by claiming that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Prophet Jesus was suffering from defects. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam was free from this allegation as we have seen. It was he that was suffering from defects. The second thing he accused Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam was that he used filthy and abusive language. Let us see how polite he was. Ruani Khazain, volume 14, page 53. My enemies are dirty swine, and their women are more wretched than the word for female dog. All Muslims regard my books with reference, with reverence and care and benefit from their sublime thoughts, except those who are the offsprings of prostitutes. Ruani Khazain, volume 5, page 547-548. The one who has no belief in our ultimate victory is fond of becoming B. And he is bound to be product of fornication. Ruani Khazain, volume 9, page 31. Are they prepared to swear? No. They'll never do so because they are liars and are derooting the corpse of falsehood like dogs. Ruani Khazain, volume 2, page 309. Every Muslim sees my books with loving eyes and affection and benefits from their learnings and accepts me. But those born of prostitutes and adulteresses whose hearts have been sealed by God do not accept me. Ayni Kamalat, page 547-508. If Abdullah Atam is saved from death, and if all the world say the Christian was correct, then the B will not follow the right path. Ruani Khazain, volume 9, page 32. Abdullah Haq is not content with our victories. He is itching to become a B. Anwarul Anwar Islam, page 30. There is nothing more foul than a pig in the world, but the ulama who oppose me are more foul than pigs. And Jami Atham, page 21. You have inflicted pain on me with your foulness. You are not truthful. I pray that you die in shame, you son of a harlot. And Jami Atham, page 288. This bee of a doctor does not thread the straight path. And Warul Islam, page 30. Anyone who believes in Moses but does not believe in Christ. Or believes in Christ but does not believe in Muhammad. Or believes in Muhammad but does not believe in the promised Messiah. Is not only a kafir but a pakka kafir. <laughs> An hour of the fall of Islam. Kalimatul Fasl, page 110. This is how polite he was. Now in spite of all this, he's written in page 18, Mawahib rahman that I have never abused anyone. <laughs> Let us look at another extract in which he insults Sayyidina Isa a.s. He writes that, you can find this in Dafi Ibala. He writes, The truthfulness of Jesus is not proved to be greater than that of the other truthful men of his time. In fact, Apostle, Apostle John enjoys a superiority over him, for he did not take alcoholic liquor, and it was never heard that a prostitute had applied perfume bought from her earnings to his hair, or touched his body with her hands or tresses or that an unrelated young woman waited upon him. It is for this reason that the Quran has used the term Hasur. Hasur means one who keeps his carnal desires in check. For Apostle John, but he does not call Jesus by this name. And he goes on. Ruani Khazain, volume 9, page 449, he writes. A young and beautiful prostitute sits close by as if sitting in his lap. He's referring to Sayyidina Isa Islam here. And he writes, rubbish, 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 and he keeps on going. Now in these two references, he's accused Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam of two things. A, taking alcoholic liquor. And secondly, associating with bad women. Yet if we look at his life, the only person that took alcoholic liquor and associated with bad women was he himself. This is a letter that he's written to a one called Muhammad Hussein Saab. He writes, My dear bro brother Muhammad Hussein Saab, may God protect you. Assalamu alaikum. Mia Yar Muhammad is being sent now, things to be purchased. You purchase yourself and purchase one bottle of tonic wine from plumber's shop. But I need tonic wine. Keep this in mind. That's just okay. Whether you bring anything else, that's irrelevant. As long as you bring tonic wine. Never mind tonic wine. He was hooked on drugs. Not only was he hooked on drugs, he gave others drugs. Article by Mia Muhammad, Mia Mahmoud Ahmed, Khalifa Qadian, taken from the newspaper Al Fadl Qadian, volume 17, number 6, dated 19 July 1929. This is what's written inside. Hazrat Masih Maud, 
made the medicine teriyaki ilahi by instructions from God. Allah told him to make this medicine. And its main constituent was opium. <laughs> and this medicine after some increase, after some increase in opium content was given to Hazrat Khalifa by Hazrat, Hazrat him, that's himself, for more than six months and himself used it off and on, off and on during attacks of disease. So you've got alcohol, he's an opium, surely that is the answer to all the rubbish that we find in these books. But whenever you have alcohol, drugs, there's one thing remaining, and that is women. The same thing that he accuses Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam of. Listen to this. This is a statement of a one called Ghulam Muhammad Qadiani, the husband of Aisha, and it's published in the newspaper Al Fazl, March 20, 1928, page 6 and 7. He writes My late wife went to Hazrat Promised Messi at the age of 15 in Darul Aman. This sire very much liked her service of massaging his feet. Now when one of his own followers objected to his behavior and the things that he was doing and the question that was written was this okay, why does the pious Hazrat get his legs and arms massaged by unrelated stranger women? The answer can be found in Al-Hakam, the newspaper April 17, 1907, page 13 the answer was given by a Qadiani named Hakim Fazaldin Qadiani, he writes he is an innocent prophet and caress with him is not prohibited. It is rather a source of suspiciousness and blessing. Basically means that it's alright if the Prophet of Qadian commits adultery. And we know as Muslims there are different forms of adultery. Adultery of the eyes, adultery of the hands and so forth. It is alright if he commits adultery. It is not alright. It is a rather a source of suspiciousness and blessing. I mean if he commits adultery it's a source of suspiciousness. And these women should think good of it. Astaghfirullah. Another reference. Zikri Habib by Mufti Ahmed, Sadiq, page 38. Inside the house of Hazrat Promised Masih lived a maid servant who was half mad. What she did one day, there was a water outlet in a corner of the room where Hazrat did his reading and writing work. Nearby were pitchers of water. She took off her clothes and started taking bath naked and it goes on and on. Now there are two things here. Either this woman wasn't mad and the reason she took off her clothes was because she had no inhibition. She was used to it. And when one is used to another person, there is no inhibition there. So either she took off her clothes because she was used to the, the Prophet himself or either Mirza Ghulam himself was insane. Nobody employs somebody who is insane to work for them unless the one who is employing is insane himself. And we've already learned that he had a weak head. His wife was also insane. So it is possible that she was insane and he was insane for... Allah knows best. But having looking at all the other extracts, he was so obsessed with women that in the work Siratul Mahdi, volume 1, page 261, he is given a fatwa that the earnings of prostitutes are halal. Balki, in his dreams, that is the only thing he would see is women. Let me relate one or two dreams. Tazkira, page 198-199, Majmu'i Ilhamad wal Mukashafat, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. He writes, August 14, 1892, 20th Muharram, 1309. Today I saw a dream that Muhammad Begum, for whom a prediction has already been made, is sitting outside on a burial ground, along with some people. She is naked from top to bottom and has a very ugly look. <laughs> Three times I told her that the interpretation of her head shaving is that her husband will die. Then I stretched my then I stretched out my both hands on her head and it goes forth. Another from the same book, an extract. July 25, 1892, Zilhijjah 20, 1309 Hijri, Monday, at 4.30 early morning I saw a dream as follows. There is a mansion in which my wife, mother of Mahmoud, and another woman are sitting. I filled water in a white water bag and poured it out into my pitcher. As I finished pouring, that other woman who was wearing pleasant red colored dress suddenly came near me. What I see is a woman, young in years, clad in red gossamer from head to foot. It comes to my mind that this is the same woman about whom I advertised, but her face seemed to be that of my wife. Either she muttered or said so in her heart, I have come. 
I said, Ya Allah, may she come. Then that woman hugged me in her arms and it goes on and on and on. So we have drugs, we have alcohol, we have women, and this is a so-called prophet of Qadiyan. He left nobody. There is not a single person that he did not insult. He, one minute he claims to be Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. One minute he claims to be the mother. One minute he claims to be Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. One minute he claims to be Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He claims to be Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. He claims to be Prophet Ismail alayhi salam. Then another minute he claims to be Shari Krishna. <laughs> Never mind Shari Krishna, he didn't leave Allah himself, the Almighty himself. Every prophet is sent by God. His aim and objective in life was insult Allah. He first insults Allah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by expressing ideas about Allah which totally go against the aqidah of monotheism. This is what he writes. He writes that Allah said this to him. Ruhani Khazain, volume 19, page 251. Allah said, I pray and keep fasting, I stay awake and sleep. The Quran says, Allah la ilaha illa wal hayyul qayyum, la ta'khudhu sinatun wa la noom. Allah, there is no God worthy of worship, but he, he does not do the worshiping, he is worshipped. The alive, the eternal, he is not take, overtaken by sleep and slumber, and the God that he is referring to sleeps. Ruhani Khazan, volume 22, he writes, this is what Allah said to him, I am with the messenger and I will answer to his call. I can be wrong, I can be right. Allah can be wrong, he writes. Astaghfirullah. He further insults Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by making this statement. He writes, Chashmay Ma'arfat, page 209, he writes, Or ye bilkul ghair ma'akul or behuda amr hai ke insan ki asal zaban to koi or ho, or ilham usko kisi or zaban me ho, jisko wo samaj bhi nahi sakta. What he said is that it cannot be understood or behuda amha and it is silly that a man receive a revelation in a language that he doesn't understand. Why? Isme taklif mala yutaqe because in this it is burdening with a responsibility which he is unable to carry out. This is what is written in Chashme Ma'rifat Safa 209. Then he writes in Nuzul al Masi page 57. زیادہ تر تعجب کی بات یہ ہے کہ بعض الہامات مجھے ان زبانوں میں بھی ہوتے ہیں جن سے مجھے کچھ بھی واقفیت نہیں جیسے انگریزی یا سنسکرت یا عبرانی وغیرہ It is surprising that I receive revelation in those languages which I do not understand one bit like English, Sanskrit, Hebrew If you put two together he's saying that it was silly of Allah to send revelation in languages that he didn't understand Astaghfirullah. Then he gives you a few examples of his revelations in Haqiqatul Wahi, page 303. That Allah said this, I love you. I am happy with you. Yes, I am happy. Life is pain. And so forth. Now he's claimed everything. What? There's one post that he's not claimed is the Son of God. So he claims the Son of God. But, and this is how he insults Allah by claiming the Son of God. And he writes, Al-Bushra, volume 1, page 49, he writes that Allah said to him, Listen to me, my son. Dafi al-Bala, page 6. Listen to me, my son, thou art from my water, and they from dust. Al-Bushra, volume 1, page 49, God addressed me in these words. Listen to me, my son. Now he's claimed to be the son of God, he goes a step further. Let me be God, let me play God, let me claim to be God. And he goes and claims to be God. Ayne Kamalat, page 564. I dreamt that I was Allah and I believed that I was really He. Kitabul Bariya, page 78. Ayne Kamalat, page 564. He writes, I saw that I was God and I believed that I was He. And in that condition, I was saying, We intend to create a new system, a new heaven and earth. Then I said, We decorated the lower heaven with lights and added, We shall create men. Out of, the, out of the extract of earth. Then he goes a step further after claiming the post of Allah. He claims that Allah showed his manly powers to him. Astaghfirullah. He writes, I saw myself as if I am a woman and Allah spilled into me his re reproductive power 
of manliness. So there's nobody he's left. Nobody he's left. He insulted nearly every person, every major figure that he could think of. Let us finish off by looking at his death because this itself was a sign that he was a liar. He himself says this. Now when he was alive, he used to consider the, the disease cholera. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Cholera. He used to consider this disease cholera as a punishment from God. And he used to curse anybody with this disease. He used to say that whoever is suffering from this disease, Allah is angry with him. This is what he's written in this respect. From the newspaper Al-Fazl Qadiyan, volume 28, page 50, he writes, He who claims that I am from God, but actually had not been honored with inspirations or conversation with him, he dies a very bad death. And is a lesson for others. Listen to this very carefully. He dies a very bad death and is a lesson for others. Now a year before he died, he published an announcement of a mubahala. Mubahala is where one party curses the other party. And this is, uh, and, he, and he published this advertisement of mubahala with a person called Molvi Thanaullah Amritsari. And this was the title. Final decision with Molvi Thanaullah Amritsari. And this is the prayer he made at this time. Take away the life of whosoever is the liar during the lifetime of the one who is not. Let the death of the liar not be caused by any human hand, but by a fatal disease such as cholera, cholera, plague or the like. Now this is the prayer he made. Let the death of the liar not be caused by any human hand, but by a fatal disease such as cholera, plague or the like. And this is what he wrote to the Mulana Sahib he was doing mubahala with, or was to do mubahala with. In your paper you have built up this reputation for me, that this person is a pretender and a liar and the jal. I have borne a lot of tortures from you, still I endured them patiently. If I am a liar and imposter as you call me in your paper, then I should perish in your lifetime because I know liars and mischief mongers do not live long. The liar ultimately meets his doom in a state of intense grief. The liar ultimately meets his doom in a state of intense grief and contemptuousness in front of his foe. It is better he perishes lest he should mislead Allah's creatures. If I am not a liar or pretender, if Allah blesses me by holding dialogues with me, if I am the promised Messiah, then by Allah's munificence according to his practice, I hope that you will not be able to save yourself from his punishment which he inflicts on disowning liars. Therefore, if that punishment which is not in the hands of a human being, but only in Allah's hands such as plague, cholera and similar fatal diseases does not descend upon you in my lifetime, then I am not God sent. This prediction is not because of any revelation or inspiration. It is merely a prayer of invoked to Allah for his decision. At the end of this adver advertisement, he writes, Ultimately, my request to Mulvi Sahib is that he should publish this entire writing of mine in his paper and write underneath whatever he wants because now the decision rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens as a result? May 25, 1908. He himself was a victim of this disease, cholera, which he had prayed for others and which, which he said is a sign of the punishment of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with this person. He himself used to consider this while he was alive. What did he write? Let the death of the liar not be caused by any human hand, but by a fatal disease such as cholera, plague or the like. He himself became a victim of this disease on May 25, 1908. 10 o'clock he had eaten his meal. He became a victim of this disease and filth oozed from both of his passages. And within 12 hours, he lay dead. And as for the Mulana Saab, lived for 41 years after this. So his own death, according to his own words, was a sign that he was a liar, not a messenger, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was angry with him. So my brothers, can this man be a prophet? He claimed everything. He even claimed to be the Hajj aswad a stone. He claimed to be Baytullah. He claimed to have monthly <laughs> periods. He, came, he claimed to have given birth. I mean, the reference, there are references for all these things. It's not something that I'm making up. 
If one requires references, inshallah, we will provide them with references. Then we find that for one minute is Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, one minute he's his mother. One minute is another prophet, one minute is the son of God, the second minute is God himself. Third minute, God is showing his manly powers to him. He's, he's on drugs, he's on tonic wine, and we have women. <laughs> Can this man be a prophet? I leave the decision in your hands, I say no further. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.